great to be with you. I love this conference. I have to admit, though, that I'm really definitely not a, um, a digital native. I'm more of a digital immigrant. And um, I just sat in the uh, lounge in there, and a whole pile of words that were going round didn't even make any sense to me. But I am completely passionate about um, the digital world and the power and the opportunity it gives us uh, for evangelism. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm really committed to this conference and how we can equip the church in a digital age. But let's start with, uh, with a good place to start. Um, a dress. Yes, no to this dress. I actually own this dress. And I, uh, just in case you want to say no, I was shopping with a friend and we were going, I was looking for the most, for a versatile, useful denim dress. And we're, we're walking through this shop and she saw this hanging up and she looked at it and she went, who would buy that? And I'm like, oh, wow, that is perfect. Uh, having purchased said dress and worn said dress, my father goes, why are you wearing a potato sack? You see, is it yes or is it no? And some of you have already switched off because I'm talking about denim dresses and you just don't understand how important the versatile or purposeful denim dress is because you've never owned one and you're never going to. Audience. Audience really matters. And there are so many different audiences. And sometimes I think, uh, when we think about sharing the digital world, we think because we can post something that suddenly everyone is going to listen. If I post about a denim dress, how many of you are going to listen? Anyone going to listen about denim dresses here? A few of you. And some of you are not in the slightest bit interested in my denim dress, are you? Let's be frank and honest. Anyone not interested? Great. Good. And that is the point I want to make. My first point in sharing in a digital world is that um, we can be fooled into thinking that we can just speak to the whole world and have a global conversation because we can send out a tweet. Now, any of you who've done anything in this world will know that isn't true. Because what generation or age do you think that is relevant to? If there's a boomer, they're going to have a different kind of conversation to a millennial. We all know that. If they come Gen Z and they're coming, the things they're interested in are totally different to the silent generation. Well, that's one divide. How about whether we're talking to somebody right across the globe, somebody in the UK, or somebody, say, in the north of the country or the south of the country, or in one of the regions? We know from voting Voting. There are different voting patterns as to whether you live in London or Oxford or maybe the rest of the world. Um, how about uh, ethnicity? Another great divide on interests, on the culture. What hobbies you've got? If you're into fishing, that's the, that's the feed you're going to read more than denim dresses. Um, class, marital status, children, pets. So maybe we could, you know, put a tweet out that would interest the person who lives in Surrey, who's age 33, who's really into hamsters. But that's quite a bespoke and small group. And we call it, when we're communicating, I know that our amazing digital team at the Church of England will create a persona for the type of people they're trying to reach. Because actually, we can't communicate to everyone all of the time. And that's really important. It's, it's a myth that by sending out a tweet, I'm communicating to the globe. I'm so not. Um, there's a specific reach, and there's targeted audiences. And that's really important when we look at how we share and how we do evangelism, um, both online and offline. So there's a challenge here for us. We can't actually, with one tweet, evangelize the whole world. It would be great if we could, but we can't, folks. So, what can I tell you about whether or not the population in this country is open? I can do you some big sweeping statements, but these are big. Let me tell you just a few clues, though. Did you know that 67% of the non-Christians in this country know somebody like you or me, who is a practicing Christian? There's going to be a clue here to eventually how we're going to do this. 67% of the population know someone like you or me who is a practicing Christian. Can you believe, this is a jaw dropper, this was research we did called Talking Jesus. You can uh, look it up on a website called Talking Jesus. That's a good clue, isn't it? 43% uh, 
percent of the population believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Having a jaw drop moment on that one? Anyone else having a jaw? We had a jaw drop moment until the BBC also did some similar research. They did it as a phone poll, we did ours as an internet, and also discovered that 43% of the population believe Jesus rose from the dead. Interesting fact in a post, in a, in a modern world, it tells us that people can still believe that someone um, rose from the dead. And did you know, this is the big one on open, that 20% of non Christians who've had a conversation with a Christian would like to know more about Jesus? I'm going to say that again because that is really key. 20%, that's one in five, one in five of the people who've had a conversation with a Christian are actually sitting there right now and want to know more about Jesus. So we could start with them. So they are open. And one in five of the people who've had a conversation with a Christian would like to actually experience or encounter something of Jesus for themselves. I'll tell you something else interesting, shall I, from our research. The younger you go, the more open people are. So if you talk to the people under the age of 35, more of them want to know. That's something that just happens, that people actually often are more fluid and making their minds up often when they're younger, and it gets harder to reach people often the older they get. Now, that is exciting good news. But the interesting thing is, who is that one in five? Are they the person who's into hamsters, who lives in Surrey, who's age 33, or are they someone who lives in London and is interested in the versatile denim dress? And how might I best communicate Jesus to them? So there are some people in our audience who are definitely open, but there are problems in our audience because we have to actually, we can't speak to everybody all at the same time. What about the medium of our communication for, um, for digital evangelism? Well, you and I know that this, again, has diversified. So, there are a lot of us on Facebook. That is completely true. There's a lot of us now on Instagram because we really need an aesthetic. We're actually trying to portray our lives as beautiful. It's all about the photo image. That's a different challenge to actually communicating in WhatsApp. What happens when you communicate in WhatsApp? You certainly can't communicate to the whole world in WhatsApp, can you? Something very fascinating has happened to our digital world, hasn't it, recently? We've gone into closed groups. So you might get a group all about hamster lovers. But the hamster lovers are all communicating in a closed WhatsApp group. And you can only get into that closed WhatsApp group if, guess what? You're a hamster lover. I haven't found a group yet on WhatsApp all about denim dresses, but maybe I'll start one. But that's the point. So again, something very interesting has happened. There is a mass audience, and we sometimes fool ourselves that we can communicate to all these people in one go. But actually, a lot of where the dialogue is going on digitally is in small, closed groups that, again, are very targeted. So the busiest place I am uh, is on my WhatsApp groups, particularly with my family, the house that I all live in, or my midweek group in church. I spend loads of time on there, but that is actually their closed groups. And we all know there's been a change probably from Google to YouTube, that the younger generation don't Google things, they YouTube things. So again, if we want to communicate, where are we going to be and where are we going to actually communicate? You can't communicate to everyone about Jesus in one click. That's what I'm trying to explain. Because the mass of the audience you need to target and the mediums are different for different people and different ages and different generations. And many of them now spend most of their life living in actually closed, much more private groups. Interesting challenge for the church as we look at um, sharing um, our faith online. How about the message? Um, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. How did the Apostle Paul go about doing some evangelism? This is quite complex in today's world because we now know so many groups. It's not just the Jews and the Gentiles. I mean, am I supposed to be hamster-loving one day and then denim dress the next day, into fishing the other day? I mean, how am I going to do that? Can you imagine? I mean, I'm going to have sort of some kind of complex, I think, if I try to do that as well. That could be really difficult to actually be all things to all people now that I'm in touch with them all, all online. That isn't really possible either. So that's quite, that's quite a challenge, but he was, he was thinking about it. Is there anything we can look at? How would we do um, asking questions in the message? This is another one. When Paul, he went to a new place, he would walk around and he would look and he would listen. Top skill, digital evangelism, 
Look and listen. Look and listen. So he didn't assume he could just walk into a place and start proclaiming Jesus. He looked and he listened. And he asked God, did he need to speak to hamster lovers or, or, or people into fishing? Who was he called to today? Which group was he going to reach next? Once he'd done that, he went and he looked and he listened. And he found out all he could about those people. And then he started from the questions they were asking. It's the same online today. It hasn't changed. Which group and who is God calling you to communicate with? then start by listening. And the joy of the digital world is you can find out so much about those people just by going online. So, for example, what do people worship today? Well, 14 foods that will change your life. If you eat those, everybody, you are going to be transformed. Uh, anyone, again, I'm just, I, am, I know that some of my audience won't have read Stylist, and some of you will. But hey, I'm just illustrating the point that we have audience issues. Stylist magazine, for the last two weeks running, has talked about food as the new religion. Did you know that? And filling, that people are using food to fill the religious vacuum in their lives. We are food-obsessed. What we can eat, what we can't eat, what's good for us, what's not, how it's going to make me a new person, how it's going to transform me from the inside out. We are food-obsessed. We're body-conscious. Um, we've got consumerism. What I buy is so important. I just walked along um, Worship Street to get here. Did any one of you walk along Worship Street? Fascinating to be walking along Worship Street in the middle of where? The city of London. So for some people, the economy and economics is what they worship. For some people, their body is what they worship. Go to a gym. For some people, the food that they eat is what they worship. Don't tell me that today's world is not religious. My word, we've never been so religious. It's just that our religions are food, or the economy, or our money, or our lifestyle choices, or my home, or my interior design. We do these things religiously. So if Paul was here, he would ask God who he should be speaking to, and then he would go, and he would look, and he would listen. And in that place, he'd find some clues. So, for example, how about having a look in Starlist? This will tell you something about particularly one of the biggest um, gods we're dealing with in our world, which is radical individualism. Um, that defines so many. All those choices you can have is because you can be a radical individual and you can choose what you want. Uh, this is one that um, was very poignant in, um, in just this week's Starlist. This is a quote, quote from uh, an activist, from Hanem Kaur, who says, I am my own greatest love. I can search this whole universe and will find no one more deserving of my own love than me. I love this quote because this summarizes um, one of the biggest issues we're dealing with in our culture today, which is the radical individual. Have you, have you, when, you, when I chat to someone like a waiter in a, in a cafe and they go, I literally said to me, it's all right, my, I'm, I'm finding my happiness from within. There is a massive, massive search and a massive um, thing that, that, that I will find everything in here, that I am enough. It doesn't matter if no one else loves me, because if I just love myself enough, if I just... Do you know the pressure that puts on you as an individual? And then we have a breakout in anxiety, mental health issues, and loneliness because actually you're defining yourself, you're loving yourself, you're making your own radical individualistic choices which end up isolating you and giving you anxiety. We've got that on a massive scale. And that doesn't take much listening, does it? It doesn't take much listening to find out these things. I'm also really proud of a friend who put up a quote on her Facebook page. My friend, she's just one of my friends on Facebook, and she put up, pondering what a curious creature self-esteem is today. This is one of our big issues. She has a marvellous long post, and she ends with, up with, I was someone great as idea, and so were you. You really can hang your hat on that. Now, that is a powerful cross-cultural, cultural challenge right into radical individualism, isn't it? And she's just done a brilliant job of digital evangelism online, on Facebook, amongst her friends. And hats off to her, because she didn't even probably know she was doing it. You see? 
And there is a clue of how we might go about and do this task of sharing. It's the messengers. The one thing that I know we need for a mass audience, for mass medium, for a diversity of ways of doing this, and for all those different groups, is we need mass messengers. We need people who are already in touch with the non-Christians. Hey, do you know, 67% of us, people out there already know one of us a practicing Christian. So that means not just me on my own as National Mission Evangelism Advisor or even our brilliant digital team, that's not actually going to get there, folks. Even all of us here as experts, what we need to do is empower the army of normal Christians in normal social media because some of them, believe it or not, are in the hamster-loving WhatsApp group. Yes! And if they're in the hamster-loving WhatsApp group, they are the light of Jesus Christ in the hamster-loving WhatsApp group. So what we've got to do is start a movement, an absolutely mass movement in the church in this country today, to not be anti-digital, but to love digital, and to be in the very place God has put us, and in that place to share our faith. Um, it's our friends, I'm going to flick through these quickly, it's our friends that really matter, they're the big group. Do you know they like us? You can look this up on Talking Jesus. We're friendly, caring and good-humoured. So they know us, they like us, they don't think we're all of those things. They don't think we are uptight or, or, or narrow-minded. And most of them, if you don't get brought up in a Christian family, the next most important way that you come to faith is through a conversation with a Christian. And online is a great platform to start a conversation with a Christian. And so the way we need to do this is release the army. There are some real challenges to that, and I just want to show you um, a little clip of someone having a go at this. Hi, I'm here at Naturally Supernatural. I've been camping for this week. I'm having a whale of a time. I've been working with the kids team. Um, it's been awesome to see kid, uh, God work with the kids, see the Holy Spirit work in amazing ways. It's also been really good for myself. I've uh, had words and messages, which has been really, really good. Thank you. Super nervous. So um, we went and we stood at the Naturally Supernatural Conference and we got people to share a little clip of what they were doing. And we didn't post it on our website. We said, post it on your social media platforms. At which stage, many people walked away. But some of them gritted their teeth and went, even though I'm nervous, I'm going to have a go at this. This girl came back. And this is what she then told us about her experience. Hi, so I'd really encourage you to share um, a little bit about your faith online. Um, I came to the stall uh, yesterday. I was really apprehensive about doing it. I really didn't think I was going to do it. Um, but I saw my friend do it and I thought, actually, this is something I can do. Um, so I did it. It was really nerve-wracking. Um, it's been online for 24 hours and I've already got loads of likes, loads of comments on it. And it's really exciting to see um, something of God's presence um, on social media. God's presence on social media. How? Particularly through your friends. There is nothing like friends in today's society and world. They're authentic. They're real. They trust us. My friends trust me. Your friends trust you. The friends of all the other people, in church, they trust them. It's a trusted, authentic voice in a world where actually, in a digital sea, people won't even find it. I could spend millions of pounds creating the most amazing thing. How are people even going to find it in the sea that's out there? But if I post a little bit about my life and my walk with Jesus onto my social media sites, into the places that I inhabit, my friends will watch that. I did that this week. And guess what? My non-Christian friends, as well as my Christian friends, looked at my little post. And my non-Christian friends, as well as my Christian friends, liked my little post about prayer. The challenge is, even for me, that was nerve-wracking. The challenge is, can we cause a revolution, a wave, a mass movement, where every Christian shares in their social media something about their walk and follow with Jesus Christ because their friends will then take that conversation both online and offline. 
and we will see so many more people come to faith. The biggest way people come to faith outside of Christian family is through a friend. The digital world helps us do that on the biggest scale possibly imaginable. But we need it to be a revolution of all of us. Join, join in with me. Thank you.